Well, as you can see from our opener, we are in our faith series. We've entitled it Faith That Works. And last week, Pastor Sean uh, was the one who led off and uh, I think just did a fantastic job. And it was great just hearing his faith journey and how he came to faith and uh, really how we can put our confident assurance in Christ, that we can put our faith in Christ. And today I want to continue on in our series. Each and every week this summer, we're going to be looking through Hebrews chapter 11. So if you've got your Bibles, if you just take them out, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 11. That's known by many as the faith chapter. And uh, I just think a, a fantastic chapter. Often I will go back when I, when I really need uh, just, a, just a new energy in my faith. Uh, it, it's something that I read. And so today we're going to be, we're going to be focusing on uh, three characters. We're going to look at Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, has anyone here ever gone skydiving? Anyone gone skydiving? Have there been a few? Yeah, I see a few hands. I see a few hands. Listen, I, I've gone skydiving, and uh, i got to tell you, I'm afraid of heights. In fact, uh, the other day, I needed uh, some blinds installed in one of our windows. It's, it's on the second floor, but it's in our, it's in our staircase. And, uh, and so it's probably about 15 feet up. And I, I had to get Pastor Sean over to install it for me. <laughs> I held the ladder. And uh, he doesn't even like heights, but uh, I thought, well, it's better for him to fall than for me to fall. And, and so, so he came over and he did, and he did a marvelous job. I mean, after I'd kind of told him what to do. But... Um, you know, I, I am afraid of heights, but I've always wanted to overcome that fear, and I wanted to, I wanted to skydive. And so I've gone bungee jumping, and then, and then I decided I was going to go skydiving. And uh, my dad, my dad said, listen, if you're going to go skydiving, I'm going to go too. Now, if you think I'm afraid of heights, my dad is really afraid of heights. And so, uh, so one day, we decided we'd go to Abbotsford. And uh, we would jump out of an airplane, a, a fully functioning one. There's actually uh, a picture. Uh, it's kind of a, a grainy one. But there we are, father and son, and we're in our jumpsuits there. And uh, I thought it would be good to get a, a final photo just in case something, you know, goes awry. And we can use it at our memorial service. Now, you know, one, one of the crazy things about that leap is that it, it was a leap of faith, but it was a calculated leap of faith. Okay? Because... We were wearing a parachute, and actually what we did is we, we jumped out at 10,000 feet so that we could actually do about a minute free fall, and in order to do that, you have to be attached to an instructor. And so when we went to that airfield in Abbotsford, uh, we were introduced to our instructors, and it's amazing when you know you're going to be putting your life in their hands, how you're sussing out the instructors, and you're like, you know what, I, I don't want to be with him. <laughs> uh, you look like you've probably got it together. And these were, uh, these were Russian instructors. They'd been in the Russian military. You know, I was asking them, so how many jumps have you done? You know, 3,500, right? And I was like, okay, that's pretty good odds. You know, you're still alive. One piece, there it is. Um, and, uh, and so anyways, we, we got attached uh, to these instructors. We started uh, circling around as we were getting higher and higher. And I'm not kidding you guys. I was sick okay? I was sick. And then my dad was sick. He was ashen. I was ashen. And all I said to him is I said, I'm going first because I knew if I didn't, I would never jump out of that airplane, right? But I took a calculated risk. And you know what's crazy? It's crazy to jump out of a fully functioning airplane. Listen, if your plane is going down and, and all the engines are burning and the pilot's yelling mayday and you, you strap on a parachute and you jump out, people will say, well, that made sense. You were actually saving your life. But when you jump out of a fully functioning airplane, that's just craziness. And it was my leap of faith and, and I, I'm here today. So everything went well. But uh, it went very well, actually. And I would highly recommend it. Uh, but... Uh, but you know what? It was. It was, a, it was a leap of faith, but it was a calculated one. Let me ask you, what has been your greatest act of faith? I want you to think about it. What has been your greatest act of faith? Where you've had to put your most faith in, in someone or something, what's been your greatest act of faith? And then I want to ask you, when did you put your faith in God? If you have put your faith and your trust in God, when did you do it? 
The first time I ever did it was when I was five years old, and I'll, I'll never forget. Each and every night before we would go to bed, mom and dad would do devotions with us. They would read out of uh, a different storybook and then out of the Bible, and we would pray together. And I remember one night, my mom and dad asking, would you like to become a Christian? Would you like to invite Jesus into your life? And you know, I just really felt then, yes, I, I wanted that. They never had to arm wrestle me or anything like that or say, you know, if you don't, you're going to go to bed without dessert or anything like that. That wasn't, that wasn't the deal. I just really felt like it was important for my life. And, and it was a real moment. In fact, it was so real that I, after that, I, I started going over to all my friends' house and I got them to kneel down and say the sinner's prayer with me. And so my mom got a bunch of phone calls from parents wondering what is going on. And so uh, this whole preaching thing actually comes quite natural to me, you know. I was doing it at five and six years old. And then I remember when I was 12 years old, I was at one of those crossroads and I was, I was trying to decide whether whether having faith in Christ was even worthwhile for me. Because I knew that I was one of those guys, I was either going to go fully in, in the direction of God, or I was going to go fully opposite that direction. And I really had to make a decision. In fact, I remember where I was when I made that decision. I was actually in a U-Haul truck, just coming through North Battleford, and it was like God was speaking to me. He was just saying, Mike, are you going, are you going to live for me or not? And I just remember in my heart thinking, I, I want to, but this is hard. And then there was that one Sunday night when, when God got a hold of my life and I, and I couldn't wait to get down to the front and pray and say, Lord Jesus, I want to make you number one in my life. Where I decided that, that putting my faith and my trust in Jesus was worthwhile. That I took that leap of faith because I, I looked around and I, and I saw other people who had done the same and, uh, and how inspiring they were for me. Who's been the greatest positive influence on your faith? When you think about it, who has made the greatest positive influence in your faith? Was it, a, was it a friend? Was it a family member? Was it a pastor, a teacher? Who was it? See, for me, it was my mom and dad. I would see my mom and dad live out their faith in front of us kids through the good times and through the very, very bad times. I saw the Bible was, was not just something that sat on the shelf, that mom and dad actually read the Bible, and then they read it with us, and they taught us how to pray. They were very formative in my spirituality, in my growing faith. And I want to do the same for my children. And then I had a pastor. I had a pastor by the name of Derek Camry. And, and he was someone who was passionate in worship. And, and he was passionate in prayer. And for the first time, I realized that you could have a real relationship with God that makes a difference. And I was like, I want that. I want that for my life. So formative. Who's been formative in your faith journey? You know, I want you to know today that we can have faith because perfect and sufficient sacrifice of Jesus. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 10. That, that the writer of Hebrews says, listen, we have a reason. We have a solid foundation for our faith. Jesus Christ, if we put our faith in him, he is sufficient he is sufficient, and we can, we can, with all of our faith and all of our trust, we can believe in him, and he will not fail us. You see, we are not putting our faith in someone or something that is fly by night. We are putting our faith in Christ, and he will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. You see, when I got to Abbotsford that day and I decided I was going to jump out of a plane at 10,000 feet, I was putting my faith in someone. I was making a calculated decision. I want you to know today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, that there is a cloud of witnesses that have gone before, that have put their faith in Christ, and they have found that he is good and his love endures forever, that he can be trusted. And that's what I did at age 12. And over and over through the thick and the thin, God has proven that that faith that I put in him was faith that was well spent, if I can say it that way. It was, it was faith that was well invested because I put my faith in Christ. Now, some have said, seeing is believing. Mike, seeing is believing. If I really saw Jesus or if I really saw God, then I would believe. But sometimes, friends, sometimes you have to believe to see. Sometimes you have to believe to see. Sometimes you have to believe just so that your eyes are, o are opened to the real realities around you. And so today, I believe that if you'll put your trust in God, that you'll begin to see things you've never seen before. 
And the three men that we'll be studying today definitely believed without seeing. Now we're going to look at the witnesses of three people who put their faith in God before the time of the flood. So if you'd turn with me in your Bible, to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. If you've got your sermon notes that are in the bulletin, you'll see it there. And it's also going to come up on the screen. And it says this. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists, and he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about the things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. If we look back to the the first set of verses, we see that Abel teaches us that faith is all about heart attitude coupled with obedience. Faith is all about heart attitude coupled with obedience. Now, it's an interesting story. The, The whole idea of Cain and Abel, brothers, the the first brothers on the earth. And they both bring a sacrifice before God. Abel brings a a sacrifice of of some lambs, and Cain brings some of the produce from the earth. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why. It just says that Abel's sacrifice was accepted by the Lord's and Cain's was not. Now, some people have wondered, why in the world is this the case? And there's a lot of speculation Many have said that, well, perhaps Abel's offering was more acceptable to God because it was a blood sacrifice. It was actually a a living thing, a blood sacrifice, so it atoned for sins. We know that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, that that shedding of blood atoned or made our sins cleansed. And so they've said, well, perhaps that's the case. Others have said that Abel's sacrifice would have cost a lot more than Cain's sacrifice would have cost. But you know, in the end, I think all of it is just speculation. Because in Genesis chapter 4, verses 7, God says to Cain, when Cain was angry and dejected because God didn't accept his, his sacrifice, he says, you will be accepted if you respond in the right way. God says to Cain, you will be accepted. Your sacrifice will be accepted if you respond in the right way. And I believe the right way is all about our heart attitude. You see, a lot of people come to God with all sorts of pomp and circumstance. Some people come to God and and they they try to say all the right words. All the these and the thous when they're praying. They they try to look a certain way. Some people will will stand in in a worship service and they hold their hands just at the right right, uh, height. And, and, they, and they close their eyes at the right part of the, the song. They want people to think that they're very spiritual. They want people to think that they, they really care about what they're singing or they really care about, about reading their Bible. Some people will carry around their Bibles at, almost as a, as a badge of honor, but they don't get it into their hearts and into their lives. You see, people want to impress others a lot more than they want to impress God. And that's what I found. I love it whenever someone will find out what I do for a living. You know, at first they're just dropping F-bombs and whatever, you know, kind of thing. Like, yeah, what do you do anyways? And I'm just like, well, actually, I'm a minister. You're what? I'm like, yeah, I work in a church, you know. And it's like, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, I usually I don't swear like this or whatever. I'm like, yeah, just take a chill pill. You know what I mean? Usually you swear like this, okay? <laughs> just because I'm around, you know, doesn't mean that everything's going to change overnight. And if there is any behavior modification, it's just to impress me. It's not to impress God. It's, it's, not, to, it's not to give their worship unto God. It's just to impress me. It's just so that, they, so that maybe I'll think that they're okay, that they're a nice guy. And you know, that's not what God's looking for. We see in 1 Samuel 15, 22, that through, 
through the words of, of Samuel, that God says to obey is better than to sacrifice. You see, to obey God is, is way better than any sacrifice you may give. Some of you have said, do you know what kind of sacrifice, Mike, I made to come to church today? God better be pleased with me. You know, I could have been on the golf course today, or I had some gardening to do, but I came here today. God better be pretty impressed with me. I want to tell you today, God is not impressed with your sacrifice. Because he sacrificed all for us on the cross. He's not impressed with your little sacrifice. He wants your obedience. He wants your life. He wants your devotion. That's what gets the heart of God going. He wants your heart. You see, I, I, am, I am so impressed that I've actually got a wife like Melissa. I can't believe that the Lord has actually blessed me with someone so good looking and, and just so long suffering, right? And I'm so thankful that she loves me. But I'm glad that it's not just lip service. Yeah, I love you. Uh, yeah, I, I love you. Love you, Mike. Okay. Anyone can give lip service. But I know that she loves me because it just it emanates through her heart. It just, it just comes through in everything that she does. That's why I love the prayers of children. They're so awesome, aren't they? You know when a kid prays, it's totally unvarnished. Aubrey just turned three years old. We had her party yesterday. And I love it when she prays. I love it. It cracks me up. You know what? When, she, when she's tired and she prays, she's going, Jesus, you know, kind of thing. She just doesn't care, right? When she's into it, she, she prays with all her heart and all of her soul. She wears her heart on her sleeve, and she really believes that God hears her. And you know what? I believe that, that for each one of us, if we're going to worship God with heart, We've got to know his word. That's why peak of the week, we're going through this. I want you to know God's word. Because as you get to know God's character, then you can actually worship him with all of your heart. As you get to know who God is in the revelation of the word, how he revealed himself to each one of us, as you ingest this word and you get it into your heart and into your life, all of a sudden worship begins to flow because you know the heart of God. I know what I need to give Melissa for her to be happy. I know how to do that because I know her. I've spent time with her. And for some of us, we need to spend time with God to know how to obey him, to know how to give our heart and our life unto him. And I believe that that's something that Abel had because Abel showed his heart for God and he showed his faith through his worship. Showed his faith through his worship. And then we read about Enoch. Enoch is the, is the next that we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. This whole idea of a man who pleases God. The, the Bible tells us that he, that he pleased God. It didn't, doesn't tell us very much about him, but that he pleased God. And all of a sudden, he's walking with God, and one day God just takes him. He doesn't die. No one puts him into the ground. No one cremates him. No one does anything like that. All of a sudden, he's walking, and God takes him. What is this all about? I believe that what the scripture is telling us today is that faith is the only way to please God. If you want to please God, you need to have faith. You know, as I read through all sorts of different translations, I went through all sorts of translations, and every single one of them says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not one of those translations says, you know, without faith, it's, it's improbable that you'll please God. None of those translations says, you know, without faith, it's going to be really hard. It's, it's, kind of, it's going to be more difficult to please God. Every single translation says, it is impossible to please God without faith. If you're trying to please God, but you don't have a heart of faith, you'll never do it. You'll never do it. And the scripture goes on to tell us why goes on to tell us that there is no substitute for faith. And the reason there is no substitute for faith, there is nothing else that you can put into the mix to take care of faith, is because you must believe that God exists. In order to have a vibrant relationship with God, you must believe that God exists. Now, there's a lot of people that believe God exists, but they don't really have a faith relationship in him. Wouldn't you agree? There are a lot of people that say, yeah, no, I believe God exists, but they don't live as if he exists. 
They, they believe that, that he's around, but they don't live as if he's there. You know, there are all sorts of people, if you were to poll people in Canada, at least 85% would say that there's a God. I mean, we get stats like that all the time. At least 85% of people in Canada say, yes, there is a God. No question, there is a God. I believe there is a God. And so the Bible tells us, in order to have faith, we have to believe that God exists. But I really believe that it must go a lot deeper than that. Because you cannot go deeper and you cannot go, go, grow stronger in your faith until you believe that he exists and he has revealed himself in so many ways through creation, through the fact of our conscience. That, that if you believe that God exists and you actually take that seriously, you see the handiwork of God everywhere. So that when I'm driving here with my Starbucks and I'm feeling good, all of a sudden I look around and I see the handiwork of God I'm just not sure about mosquitoes. I don't know how those fit in. <laughs> Perhaps some of you today, you need to believe in God. Perhaps that's just the start. For some of you, you might be here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God. First of all, in order to do that, in order to have a faith that would please God, you need to believe that he exists. But then you go to the next step and you must believe that God cares. And this is really the crux of it all, folks. This is the crux of it all. God cares. That's one of those wow moments. He rewards those who seek him. That's what the Bible says. He rewards those who actually seek after him. You see, God is, is not someone who is immovable. God is not someone who, who, is, who is impassionate, who, who doesn't give a rip about anything. He cares about you. He cares about your circumstances. He formed you together even when you were still in your mother's womb. He cares about your life circumstance. So not only does he exist somewhere out there, not only did he create and sustain this world that we live in, but he actually cares about you. He cares about your circumstance. He cares about what's going on in your life. And I believe that there are some of you today that if there's anything you would take home today, that you would take home that God cares. He cares about you. You need to hear that. See, for me, it's so easy to put my faith in God because when I understand that he cares about me, that not only does he exist, but he actually cares about me here in Edmonton, Alberta, all of a sudden, something happens in my heart and I just want to, I want to fall in love with Jesus more and more. Some of you have, have, have sat through this, this uh, worship service that we just had and you hear some of these songs and, and, and you talk, you hear us singing about falling in love with God and you're like, that is so weird. But it's not. It's not when you put your faith in a God who not only exists, but he cares. He cares about you. You know, I really believe that when we look at the life of Enoch, we show that Enoch showed his faith through his walk. What does it look like to walk with God? What does it actually look like to walk with God? You know, interestingly, very little is said about Enoch throughout the scriptures. Very little is said. You know, it was Enoch who is the father of Methuselah, who ends up being the oldest man in the Bible. We know that, we know that he had a few sons. But other than that, we really know very little about Enoch, other than the fact that he pleased God, that he walked with God, and then God took him away. You know, I believe to walk with God is to live a very normal life in the ups and the downs, the crying babies, the, the trying to eke out a living, the toiling with the land. I believe that living and walking with God is something that's done in the ordinary and the mundane. You see, we all love to hear a story about someone who's done something exceptional. We all love to go to movies and, and hear about a hero that, that has done something so exceptional and turned around the course of history. We love those things. I mean, who wants to go to a movie where, where all it is is two hours of following me around with a camera? You don't want that, you guys. That's boring, okay? It's just like, what is he doing right now? You know, kind of thing. And, and I'm getting some meat out of my teeth or something. I, like, it's boring, but you know what? To walk with God sometimes is just to be faithful to him as he is faithful to you in just the mundane and the ordinary. You might say, well, Mike, I'm not really lighting any fires for God. I'm just trying to raise my family as best as I can. I'm just trying to do devotions with him and, and pray with him at mealtimes. That's all I'm trying to do. I, I don't know if I'm very exceptional in my faith. 
You look at Enoch's legacy, one who walked with God, and he's the only one that God took just like that. It's amazing. He still speaks to us today. Enoch's faith still speaks to us today. He lived 365 years. And I can't imagine, it was, it was before the days of 50-inch of HDTVs, and, and it was before the days of, of all sorts of different automobiles. He just lived a normal life. He had kids, and he tried to raise them to serve the Lord. See, I think we need more heroes of the faith like that. Mom, Dad, I think if there's anything that you can do, that just that you would live for God in the mundane. You'd live for God on Mondays and Tuesdays. When things drag out, that you'd live for God when your boss is on your case. That you just say, you know what, I am choosing to live for him all of my days. And I believe that that's what pleases God. I believe that that's what Enoch had. He was a man who believed that God exists. And he believed that God cares. That God even cared about how he lived in the ordinary and in the mundane. And then we see Noah, the example of Noah. And Noah teaches us that faith often defies human reason. The Bible records for us in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that Noah lived in a time of exceptional wickedness. In fact, as as we look in in Genesis chapter 6, the people were totally bent on evil. And in fact, in some translations, it's basically like that's all that they could do was evil. Their, Their minds were twisted and warped. They could not think good thoughts. And this is the kind of life that Noah lived in. These were his neighbors. How would you like neighbors like that, hey? I mean, I know it's rough when you have a drug dealer down the street or whatever, you know. Can you imagine your neighbors are totally bent on evil? They can't do a good thing. And that's the kind of kind of day that Noah lived in. You know, he didn't have Bible studies like peak of the week to encourage him. You know, on that, on that Wednesday when it's just like, oh man, it's been a rough week. I just, I just need to hear from God. He didn't have church where, where he could get together with other, other Christians and be like, I'm not alone in all of this. The bottom line is, the scriptures tell us that basically Noah was the only one that did right before the Lord. Noah and his family. Talk about being alone. Talk about being a loner and feeling like you're an island. While everyone else is bent on evil, you're trying to live for God. That's a rough place to be in. But you know, I think it just gets rougher and rougher and rougher. Can you imagine when God comes to Noah and says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Okay, this is where it goes from like zero to crazy really fast, okay? 3.5 seconds basically. People, this is a time before rain, okay? It's before the flood. It didn't rain during those times. People didn't have boats during those times. And all of a sudden, God gives Noah these plans for an ark, a big boat. And he starts to build. And it takes him somewhere around 300 years to build this boat. I can only imagine the ridicule. I know what happens or how I feel if my next-door neighbors don't mow their lawn. Or if, you know, they leak oil on on the pavement, you know, kind of thing. I'm just like, come on, you know, come on. Can you imagine what it was like? Noah is building this massive boat. And everyone around is going, what are you doing, guy? And he's like, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. God told me it's going to rain. Listen, we would put that kind of person in a white coat that had straps like this. We'd put him away. And yet he believed in God. And with every every pound of the hammer, with with every cut of the saw, I believe that Noah was living out his faith. Amidst all the ridicule, amidst the people that were saying, you are out of your mind. I can only imagine Noah's kids, they're at school, and they're like, your old man is the craziest old man I've ever seen in my whole life. My dad says that, that he should be committed, you know? And yet he was willing to put his faith in God. He was willing to say, I believe God's going to come through. I can only imagine, I can only imagine finishing that ark and going, Lord, I did my part. Please do your part. Please do your part. And it begins to rain. God comes through. You know, when I I look at, at Noah, I think, man, just... Just when some of us think things are hard at our workplace. 
just when we think that things aren't going our way in our workplace. Can you imagine what it was like for Noah in his workplace? And I really believe that Noah showed his faith through his work. He obeyed God, and God saved his whole family. You know, today, unlike the days of Abel, Enoch, and Noah, we have the Bible. It's full of the revelation of God. God has revealed himself to us through the Bible. You know, when when Noah was was building the ark, God had come to him and, and God had given him plans. But I can only imagine so many days where he was like, was, was I out of my mind that day? Did I have heat stroke? Was I hearing voices in my head when the ridicule was there? What, what's going on? And yet today we have so much more than even these men of faith had because we have God's word, his full revelation, that we can check this word. We can say, are we out of our minds? And we can check it here with God's word. We can actually put our faith in God who has revealed himself to us and and made sure that it got written down so that each and every one of us in our own language can actually hear the voice of God. Perhaps not audibly, but we can hear the voice of God over and over and we can study that, that voice of God. We can know him, we can obey him. We know his character so that when he asks us to do something, we can actually even test it and say, is this something that's in line with something that God would say to me? We can actually test those scriptures. And that's why I believe that we need to digest the Bible. That's why we need to get it into our hearts. We've heard it before. I mean, my goodness, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. I don't know how else to say it. Still, it doesn't matter. We just don't read the Bible. We don't. It's almost as if we're illiterate. And I want to encourage you today. If the, if the men of old before the flood, if they had what we have today, it would have even been more exceptional. They would have said, look at what, look at what we did. Look at how we put our faith and our trust in God. Can you not do the same today? And that's the thing that God has been challenging with me with. That I would live a life of faith each and every day. And I want to tell you today, all of these men received their rewards for their faith in God, whether it was in this life or in the one to come. Abel still speaks to us. Though he was killed by his brother, he still speaks to us, and God prepared a place for him. Enoch was taken by God to heaven, and Noah's life and family were saved from destruction. Friends here at North Point, as a community of faith, Even though we don't always see the results or the fruit of our labor, let's look to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's put our trust in him. He hasn't brought us this far just to drop us off. We've got new people that are coming into this community that need to know all about Jesus and they need to know all about his goodness. Let's continue on living lives of faith so that when people see us, they would say, I want to be like them, just like I did when I was a young person. And I looked at my parents and how they modeled faith in Christ. And I looked at my pastor and how he modeled faith. And I said, I want to be like that. May we put our faith in Christ in such a way that when people see us, that they would say, I want what they have. And so you, what's your legacy of faith going to be? What is your legacy of faith? Abel, Enoch and Noah, thousands of years later, are still speaking to us about faith. What will be your legacy of faith? What will be said of your worship, your walk, and your work? Who or what is your faith in? Would you just bow your heads with me this morning? This morning, perhaps for some of you, you have never put your faith in Christ. You have never said, Lord, I believe that you exist, but not only that, I believe that you care, that you reward those who earnestly seek you. And today you would say, Mike, I want to put my faith in Christ. I want to believe in him. I want to make him the very center and the core of my life. I want his spirit to come in. I want him to cleanse me of my sin. I want to start a relationship with God. If that's you this morning, I want to pray for you because this is, this is one of those TSN turning points where your life can change radically because of that decision. And if that's you, I just want to pray for you. If you slip up your hand, and I want to pray as I close, pray for you. Is there anyone here? Yes. Anyone else here? That's for, yes. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. Absolutely. And then for those of you who have put your faith in, in, and, and trust in God today, would you just be encouraged that no matter what you're going through, that God cares? 
and that you would just take that leap of faith because he cares. So Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Abel, for Enoch and Noah, how they continue to speak to us today about what it is to have faith in you, in our worship, in our walk, and in our work. And Lord God, for each and every person that has raised their hand, Lord Jesus, right now, I just pray that you'd come in and you would change their lives. Lord, you'd cleanse them of their sin. And God, I pray that they would start a relationship with you just like I did at age 12, just like so many others here have done. And God, I pray that they would see that you are good and your love endures forever and that they would live for you each and every day, just putting a little more faith in you, trusting that you're going to come through for them, trusting that you're good. And so, Lord, we commit our lives to you, and we thank you for all that you've done. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, it's been so great having you here with us at North Point. Just want to encourage you Wednesday night, peak of the week. We'd love to have you come out. Have a great week. Lord bless you.